in thinking about this convening, I realized that we couldn't have a discussion about the topic of art and justice without you, Carrie, and without you, David. And because we don't um, have all the time that we'd love, I think we said at the start, we're going to, to dive right in <laughs> and think through the function of how it is that we create space and institutions as a builder, yes, but as an artist who is interrogating them. And I wanted to ask you, Carrie, a question first, and I think it's one that's on David's mind as well. How do you go from, or what's the impetus to, as an artist, initially focusing on photography, arrive at a point where buildings, the Guggenheim, the Louvre, <laughs> become your raw materials for oh, your no. work? Do you have the slides? Actually, you can start yeah. them any time. Oh, yeah. But right. let's see. Let's. Yeah, they because, they, be because they'd actually become a reference, I think, for the audience. Yeah. Um, you know, this, this is an interesting thing. I mean, I'm thinking about, first of all, um, um, welcome to the coming out party. <laughs> <laughs> We're calling this, this, this young woman I have known for a very long time since she started at, uh, at MoMA. Oh. And I have watched her grow and mature and become her own very, 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 very special uh, person uh, in this wonderful way. I thought I saw like something shooting across the sky. <laughs> I thought, ah, that's a star. <laughs> so we are actually coming up. We should meet you. We should meet you. We should meet you. Crackle. Well done. You know, um, um, social justice, of course, is twin tr trending at the moment, yes. which I find uh, wonderful and problematic. Mm -hmm. um, hi, Skip. Hi. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, the people that I know, the people that I care about, my community, the community that I've grown up in, we've been working tirelessly towards and around notions mm -hmm. of social justice for decades. That's right for decades. Um, when I got my first camera, uh, it was from uh, my boyfriend, who was awful, he was a terrible person, but he, gave me, but he gave me a camera. It was the best thing about him. And, uh, and I knew immediately, really, I knew immediately that it was something that I, uh, that I wanted to use as a kind of expressive tool to get at some of the things that um, concerned me, that I thought were so fundamental about, uh, about who we are. Beyond, beyond blackness, yes. beyond color, uh, but um, as uh, complicated, difficult, uh, uh, complex uh, uh, bodies of, of humanness, right? Really uh, trying to understand something about that and about how to express that immediately mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, photography. As I thought about that, I think also as a young child. I think I was very fortunate to have such a wonderful father, a wonderful father who very early on in my life um, insisted um, as a young child, I remember him picking me up saying, <laughs> never forget that you have a right, that you have a right and that you're human and that you have a right to be. That was, Powerful, mm -hmm. and it's a, I think a, a lesson that has um, permeated I think every aspect of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I am therefore comfortable in the world, and I'm comfortable in this complex skin. Yes. yes. So um, I started very early, Sarah, thinking about these I these ideas. Mm -hmm. And the move then into a realm that. Is David's right thinking about institutions? How did you start to move into the, that space and thinking about taking over an institution or using it as a backdrop to make a statement? Well, you know, interestingly enough, David. And as in my, you know, when I was in my early my early twenties uh, or so, I, I started paying attention to buildings. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, it's like sort of a, this sort of new architecture. It's like a new architecture that was sort of emerging where all buildings, they were all sort of glass, dark glass, and they sort of uh, insisted that it reflected you. 
mm. right? I mean, it was like a, like a strategy around architecture. And I thought, this is really interesting, <laughs> you know? But I wasn't, but I didn't know that I was interested in architecture. Mm. I was just paying, sort of paying attention to what these buildings were doing and how it was made to feel in relationship to the architecture, mm. you know? Uh, not unlike, you know, being a student at Berkeley and, and, and walking on that campus and feeling like the architecture had a certain kind of power that mm. insisted that I respond to it as a subject, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? You know, and that it let me know whether or not I was actually invited in or out of it by its very structure. I thought that was so fascinating. And the way I was made to feel walking into a building, walking down you know, a, a promenade, walking up a flight of stairs, all of that, you know, walking into that great library down the road that you know, your, grand, your great, great, great uncle had something to do with. I mean, you know, all, all of that was sort of really interesting to me. So these ideas about sort of you know, developing, sort of looking at that and then paying attention to notions about institutions and what institutions were, mm -hmm. how institutions function, the power power of institutions mm. also became sort of a natural kind of curiosity. I thought, ah, mm. I think I'm going to go stand in front of those things. <laughs> I think I'll go witness them, stand in front of them, and sort of, not, not just sort of confront them so much, but use my, use my skin, use my body as a way of marking what they have historically been. What was inside of them, what was outside of them, what needed to change in relationship to them, what needed to be developed inside of them. So these ideas about sort of institution building as well were, I think, um, very early, early thoughts. And, um, and so I've struggled hard and um, worked hard to, uh, to, to get inside of them to critique them, to understand them, to understand my, my body in relation to them, in relationship to them, yeah. but also to understand something about the power of these institutions and what they are and what they exude mm -hmm. by their very architecture. Yes. Yes. And that's where David comes in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 no, absolutely. I mean, Carrie, I remember when I first saw your images and um, they affirmed to me um, the absence that I was always very sad by of the black body in spaces and institutional sort of buildings or, or in architecture in the urban world that kind of had the sort of dignity and the confidence of belonging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, my sort of trajectory into wanting to work in the built environment came from that sense mm -hmm. of being in London and uh, growing up with uh, my, my youngest brother who was disabled and being you know, an immigrant in the country mm -hmm. and being invisible in that context, but also having a disabled brother and having that second invisibility of disability. Mm -hmm. This is the late 70s and 80s. And it was, a, it was a kind of horror I couldn't spin out of. So you came to architecture very early then, yeah. as well? In, in, in its emotion, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so in a way, this idea of wanting, feeling that one had a right to exist, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I love what you just said mm -hmm. about your father. That's, mm -hmm. I've got to do that with my kids. The thing to go home and do immediately. Mm -hmm. um, was a kind of very powerful um, sort of driver. Um, and it's, it was just, Hmm. not willing to believe that one couldn't be part of the construction of this or the disruption and the, the kind of changing of this to be a little bit messier. Because actually the narrative of architecture, ironically, it's, it's, it's a very strong but silent story maker that is the stage mm -hmm. in which we all perform it. Right. And what we don't realize is that that stage actually choreographs how we behave. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and so, when you did, when you came to architecture, your very particular way of marking a building, mm -hmm. and sort of using a kind of skin and scrim on buildings, mm -hmm. is sort of also then related to this idea of, of making place yeah. in a very particular kind of way yeah. that moved it outside of even though you're working within a Western tradition mm -hmm. of reflecting something away from its Western madeness. Is that right? Well, I think that I became very interested in the idea of um, technologies and cultural and, and culture. 
And what has been conflated, I mean, I think architecture is one of the last disciplines that hasn't um, sort of had this kind of post-structuralist moment of kind of crashing that sort of pyramidal narrative um, of some sense of things being just that way. So the language and the tradition of um, the classical language or the sort of neo-Greek classical language, which has become the sort of Northern European and sort of American sort of language, has not been questioned as a narrative of what it means to be a citizen and what that idea embodies. It has, it has been in its universal sense, mm -hmm. but it was kind of born under an idea of a certain kind of nationalism. Mm -hmm. It was about a civilization. And the emergence of that civilization. And it's a very beautiful language, and its roots come from yes. Egypt. Mm -hmm. So it is a, a, a language that comes through and refines and shifts. Mm -hmm. But in a way, I think what architecture has been very problematic in doing is that it's, it's started to kind of systematize it as a system for everyone. Mm -hmm. And in sort of migrating across through empires and colonization, right. um, through this sort of system, it started to subjugate everybody under the same structure. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, I think the cracks of it and the fractures of it, you know, uh, you see in the various mutations that are all over the place. But I, I think actually underlie a kind of systematic problem of this idea of trying to universalize everybody under a singular architecture born from a specific, specific narrative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, in, in, in this sort of work, and I, you know, I, I actually photographed the Smithsonian Museum mm -hmm. because uh, of course, I needed to stand in front of it too, mm. and inside of it. And I, you know, I haven't done that yet. I photographed the outside, but I haven't photographed my body in relationship to it. So that's my sort of next project when I get to get to 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 DC. But you did make these sort of disruptions then, and that was a part of the early what work thinking. was about so that, that mm. way of you know, and, and also in that city of, of Washington D.C. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. you know yeah. this 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 added layer of framing. The, it's like reframing the frame of the building. Mm -hmm. well, can you do for us a, a bit of a dive in terms of what Carrie is describing? What intervention do you see is there in the topography of? The mall, right? Let's let's go into so the, design. Yeah. No, I mean I think the mall is quintessentially the 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 play. It's the it's almost the, the perfect set of this idea of this sort of universalizing architecture mm -hmm. that becomes the kind of dominant form. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that you, if you look at the history of it, right from the building of the White House to you know Congress, etc., the mm -hmm. monuments, Lincoln's monuments, the early works right through to the American Museum, which is an abstraction, but it's exactly the same language. Some people don't realize it's, yeah. it's basically abstracted, pilastered, neoclassical architecture right. made in a modern form. Mm -hmm. um, there is a singular language mm -hmm. continually kind of moving along. And it just became very clear to me that if we were going to make this museum, and it's interesting that the earlier sort of ideas of a kind of national museum of African Americans used a sort of Egypto style, you know, um, uh, the, you know, when it was being imagined, you know, 200 years ago, it was kind of referring to this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I felt that it needed to finally break mm -hmm. the picture. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The project had to break the picture. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it does. It absolutely. Very absolutely. well. But not in any way to kind of destroy something. No, 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 no. But no, to no, complicate no. something. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, those it. are like, you know, I mean, that's the thing that's is sort of interesting. It gets back to something that Sarah had been talking about earlier, these sort of ideas about the nature of invention. Yes. Yeah. So, that, yeah. so, that, so that how do you, you know, dealing with what we're dealing with, these sort of complicated ideas around, uh, around, uh, around race, around, uh, uh, you know, colonialism, around empire, all of these, all of these sort of very dense complicated ideas, how do you then, in the, in, in, in the moment of making, in the moment of rather the consideration of making, mm -hmm. begin to understand uh, uh, what your sites of disruption are, what your, what your critical inquiry is, and then how to manifest that into the work itself, mm -hmm. and hopefully beg the question from the audience that this is not only mm -hmm. um, uh, not only what you see, but it's also um, uh, more than that. And this is also a critique mm -hmm. of the thing that you're seeing and the thing that we've understood yeah. from the past. And that, I think, is really exciting. Like how that gets 
done. And it's something that I'm uh, endlessly um, thinking about. Uh, you know, it's something that, again, Sarah and I have often talked about as well, and, and, and with you as well, David, you know, that these ideas about a kind of modernism as it relates to um, um, black cultural production right. has really not been spelled out in any sort of sophisticated way, though the work is there, Correct. right? The, the work is there, and right. the work is it's there in a, in a beautiful, yes. incredible, yes. articulated form. Yeah. But nobody has been really sort of writing about right. it, exactly. which is why I'm so excited about the work that you've been doing. Well, you're so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, a conversation that we've been having for a while. The, the way in which a discussion about race can cauterize a focus on the imaginative work, the original work of an artist, is to the detriment of the entire field, right? So you have this, in the opening to the edited anthology that's about to come out on your work, which is coming out in the spring, you have this question um, that Huey Copeland posed, right? Huey Copeland, who's here as, a, as Du Bois fellow for the year. He, oh, Huey is here? That's I, nice. I hope he is here. <laughs> yes. Huey, Huey asked this question. Oh, you found him? Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> You know, have we all been sleeping on Carrie Mae Weems, right? <laughs> in, in our form. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and the answer is, well, we haven't, but why have we, you know? <laughs> and why have we, right? <laughs> because of the focus on the, the need to focus on race to the detriment of not considering the formal inventions that are their own interventions, that are their own Oh, yes, absolutely. Right? It's so, the easy stuff to do. Exactly, exactly. It's the easy stuff to do, and it's mm -hmm. the most expected thing to do. And, and, and this is, I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so sort of complicated because, in part, it's the reason that we're all here. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that we're here critiquing the thing that we're also critiquing. Exactly. Right? Exactly. But, but it, and, so it's, and, so, and so it becomes sort of compounded. Yeah. yeah. But, but I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm not at all, um, I'm, I'm so not interested really in me, but I am deeply interested and deeply engaged um, with my field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm deeply engaged with my field. I care about it, yeah. and my only deep interest is in um, participating, it, participating in it in a deep and complex way mm -hmm. of engaging the subjects of art and photography in deep and complex ways of bringing together extraordinary artists and thinkers and writers and historians in order to think about it. And of course, in asking the sort of critical questions that will move us from, from the deadlock into a dynamic future, right. right? What are the questions that we are posing that need to be posed in relationship to this cultural production? What are the terms? Who are the writers? Who are the historians? Who are the makers? And how is that being understood? And how do we use these sort of extraordinary institutions yes. and these brilliant young minds and students to really interrogate yes. in a new way, to really broaden and expand this field? We are, there is no doubt in my mind, that we are in sort of an extraordinary moment of renaissance, of breaking new ground in new territory. There are things that are going on in this world that are absolutely mind-boggling. You know, from robotics to technology to, I mean, we're just in this amazing period, and yet we're still talking yeah. about race. Yeah, exactly. So, right? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, while the rest of the world is like, hello, Florence. So, forging into this sort of extraordinary future. Mm -hmm. You know, we are still down here in the mud, grappling around this question of race. That that's where we have been, that we can be stuck. So how do we move this forward and yeah. into the future yeah. uh, in a way that I think is really dynamic? And I think that the work that I'm thinking about, the work that I'm hoping to, that I make, the work that I, I assume that David is making, I think starts to get at tearing some of this away from the muck and spinning us into a future that is deep and complex and rewarding and dynamic. And that's what I am that's what I'm engaged in. Mm -hmm. I'd love to add to that because um, it's really beautiful that the Julian Abel, the, you know, say hi to Peter for me. I haven't <laughs> spoken to him in a while. <laughs> but um, 
actually Peter talked very much about his great grand uncle mm -hmm. when we were working mm -hmm. on the project. But what's beautiful for me was that what Julian was doing was affirming mm -hmm. that um, the language that was supposed to be the language of sort of Northern Europeans was a language that could be mastered by anyone and manipulated. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what he did was even before he was visible, he'd already demonstrated a complete mastery mm -hmm. of a language that he was not supposed to be privileged to understand. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when I turn up, when I turn up and I'm working, yeah. I am assuming that I don't even need to demonstrate that. that. <laughs> it's already done. Yes. If yes. you don't know it, that's your ignorance. <laughs> yes, right. I need to move past what that pedestal has given me, which is to bring my imagination into the world. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. And that's, I think, the, the beauty of the moment. Yes. So we are talking about race, but I also think that it's kind of impossible not to talk about race. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> in a way, it is, the, it is the kind of, we are talking about race not in its diminutive or sort of infantilized sense, but we're talking about race in its expansive possibility of yes. complexity yes. in the world. Yeah. Yes, yeah. this is true. true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you so know, it's... I've been talking a lot recently um, about um, Louis Armstrong because I absolutely love him. I love this man, and um, you know, and I've been thinking about sort of the sort of sort of notions of um, uh, speaking a lot about in the last few months uh, around notions of influence, mm -hmm. notions of influence, and um, um, and how influence operates. And you sort of talked about this idea about language, and I thought about sort of hip hop and 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 what hip hop is. You know, this idea that uh, that that uh, that are people uh, uh, um, bereft of language, right, would go on to develop and create and master a kind of language and to use it and under sort of extraordinary pressure mm -hmm. that, it would, that it would generate something that was so magnificent that it would change the way in which language is spoken around the world. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's sort of an extraordinary right? idea, right? And the same thing is true with, you know, with, with, with Armstrong. I mean, you know, this, this, this man you know, from Louisiana you know, who creates this sort of extraordinary sound, there's absolutely nothing like Louis Armstrong playing like the trumpeter clarinet, right? You know, working under extraordinary pressure who produces this thing that is unmatched in the world. Or somebody like Aretha, right, our queen who died, who received her PhD, her honorary degree from Harvard several years ago, who again, you know, simply soars, right, above all other voices in her giving uh, back uh, to um, a community and a group and a society and a culture, uh, a country that ultimately um, uh, attempted to deny her uh, that right. And so what you do then out of that denial is to, to create sort of extraordinary interventions and innovations that have uh, <coughs> re relevance uh, for not only you, but the entire world. And you bring sort of new utterance uh, that simply would not have existed um, without it. So what I so love about you bringing up Armstrong is it also it, it goes back to a point that David made that you're making as well, which is that the demonstration of mastery over a particular form can be an act of resistance yeah. and can be a mode of justice mm -hmm. making. So for example, and, and I don't know if you, you heard earlier, but I was speaking about this event, this convening as one that is in lineage mm -hmm. with the work that has gone on before. Now, that includes the extraordinary convenings that you've put on, and this also includes the work that Deborah Willis has done with black portraitures. This includes the work that's happened in the Cooper Gallery and beyond Hutchins Center. For your convening at the Guggenheim, what I so loved is that you asked me to read a passage about Louis Armstrong that I wrote for The Rise. Oh, and, uh -huh. and that was this moment in which I, I learned of this fact uh, from Wynton Marsalis, that Louis Armstrong had catalyzed the a narrative of, of justice by simply being the, the genius figure that he was. And I, what I mean by that is this. In 1931, there was a young boy going to hear Louis Armstrong in Austin, Texas. And he was in a period of deep segregation, of course, at the time, but was so struck by the genius of, of Armstrong that he knew in that moment that segregation must be wrong. He just knew it. And even though his friend to his left, he remembers, uttered a racial epithet about African-Americans used during the day, this young man, Charles Black Jr., was sure. Now, Charles Black Jr. said in that moment that his life shifted, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. He started walking towards justice. Mm-hmm. Oh, he would go on to become one of the lawyers that would argue in the Supreme Court mm-hmm. case, Brown versus Board of Education, yeah. that outlawed segregation. Lovely. Lovely. And then he taught at Yale and Columbia. For those who don't know, I know, Carrie knows. The, he taught every year with this Armstrong listening night. To honor the man who created this oh, life-changing shift. That's so, so Armstrong is doing the very work that David describes. That as he walks in, he's he's aware that he that he's performing as well. It's a statement through mastery, right, of resistance and justice. Correct. And this is what your work performs as well for us. So, yes. Yeah. The the reason for focusing on originality invention as the title for this panel is deliberately to be able to salute the work that we don't often get to discuss because we focus on race. However, I just want to go back to a point that Jelani Cobb made on his uh, panel that citizenship is a racial narrative. Right? And this, I believe, is in, in part why the entanglement that uh, Saidiyad Hartman is describing, that Elsa Hardy was sort of referencing this kind of entanglement in the conceptual sense, I think it's important for us to put back on, on the table. Is it possible to move away from race as part of a cultural narrative here? Um, but to get back to originality and invention, there's, one, there's a question I want to ask David, which I'll, maybe will connect also to Carrie's work. And, and that is, David, and I've never asked you this, what is the function of working with artistic practice beyond the field of architecture that so inspires you? Is there an act of representational justice in your decision to engage with, say, a Chrysophilia in terms of how their work is presented on the world stage? Because you often engage with artists in terms of how their work is presented. And it's rare, and it's beautiful. Um. I, I just, it seems incredibly obvious to me, and, mm. uh, but I, I, I just have always been in awe of the visual arts ability to simply take the language and shift it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it sort, of, it sort of has always played in a kind of almost like in a Trojan horse sort of, sort of manner in the sense that it sort of somehow just shifted the language, mm-hmm. took took the narratives and then presented a new form. Yeah. And somehow because of some ability of art to be able to sort of spellblind us, mm-hmm. have we been able to move the language um, and create an aesthetics very quickly. So I was just very jealous. <laughs> no, I'm being silly, but in a way I was in awe of that aura. So I wanted to, in a way, activate my own practice by saying that I'm interested in architecture being part of that aura Mm -hmm. within the lens of the black experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the artists are particular. I think they're not, they're all very particular artists. So then this redesign, for instance, for the Studio Museum. Mm -hmm. Studio Museum is a wonderful moment. Right? (laughs) Right? I mean, you know, it means that that, that, that it will hold yeah. that it holds that. Yeah. Um, it's the Odyssey finishing, right? right? <laughs> the Studio Museum really, is the Odyssey. It's really lovely. It's really lovely. <laughs> very, very excited. It opens yeah. when? Uh, in three years' time. Yeah. Yeah, mm. blink of an eye yeah. in architecture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we are also here because of the performance that Carrie will offer us. I know we, we have a few more minutes for questions. I, we haven't opened up for questions from the audience, but there might be a time yeah, to, to allow for that. So I'm saying this very slowly so that you can kind of formulate your question <laughs> and prepare to um, come to the center if you have one, because we will have Carrie perform in a, in a bit. OK. Hello, thank you. Kenyon Adams from the Louis Armstrong House Museum and Archives. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So um, our whole team is here. This whole Louis Armstrong Museum team. I love it. So I have a question about the relationship between mastery and resistance. And we have, um, I think we have a, a, the benefit of a lot of really robust reflection since you know the death of figure like Armstrong who died before they were, you know, post-colonial critique was something that a ninth grader would just render to me in a <laughs> casually in a conversation, you know. So much work and thinking has really been done since then uh, yeah. to reflect upon his influence. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my, th- my question is the degree to which mastery is held by a community mm-hmm. and how, mm-hmm. you know, when we, when we look at a figure like Armstrong, how is it that we can understand um, 
you know, David, when you talk about this presumption or the assumption uh, that something has been proven, therefore I step into my imaginative construction uh, with a freedom and a givenness. You see this in Armstrong, but how is it that we can, from this distance, uh, looking back on an over a century of a legacy that's so prolific and expansive, how can we perceive and then draw out and then move forward towards a futurism around the, the fact of the bodies and lives represented holding the mastery that makes it even possible, such that a figure like an Armstrong or a Carrie Mae Weems becomes um, something that is uh, expressed profusely in, in communities, understood in communities, that gives values and reflects back to those communities um, into, again, a futurism is what we're concerned about at our archives, the futurism of this legacy. Right. Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. Um, I can yeah. jump in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I have a hunch that um, yeah, yeah. the question, there's a kind of, there's a, a wonderful sort of dialectic in this thing of mastery because mastery renders something almost seemingly like it's normal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, when I think when somebody masters something, they bring it into a kind of normality, and it sort of becomes the way in which we all assume a basis of intelligence and move forward. Yeah. I think the criticality of, of our civilization and the experience of being a human being is that we continually need to master. <laughs> and there is a kind of, there is a requirement in using that as an intelligence and using that as a way to build upon the kind of foundation of the masters. <laughs> so I think it's, I know that you're sort of wanting to see if we can kind of re-go, if I understand your question, you're trying to see if we can go back and see the kind of magnitude of the mastery that Armstrong, for instance, erupted. Is that somehow, am I sensing what your question is sort of at the base of? It seems like you seem to kind of want to allow, want people to be able to see that and to use that as a basis to understand their history and their problems. Yeah. That it's possible to take up Armstrong. Yeah. yeah as a subject of mastery. But he is. Without, without at the same time mm. holding um, the community that must have been a part of shaping uh, that mastery in a way of perceiving its uh, animation as we move forward with constructions of mastery relationship. It's a Mm. It is a seminar question. Yeah, we're saying it's a question for a seminar. Well, we'll but uh, but <laughs> context yeah. is everything. Yeah. Yeah. Context it's, is everything. Yeah. Right. We really did design today to possibility. be a seminar. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I mean, it, it, it seems that I mean, I, I think that you know, I, th this idea about futurisms is something that uh, we're all tasting, mm -hmm. right? That we know that we are uh, on the cusp of something yes. new, yes. and we can feel it. There's all of this that's uh, bubbling up. We're talking ultimately about ideas, uh, layers of ideas, and legacy is one of those things. My sense, I've only heard a few great musicians in my life. I've heard a lot of music, but I've only heard a little bit of great music in my life. I've seen a lot of painting but I've only seen a few really great paintings in my life. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And a part of that is, has to do, I think, with um, that thing that is absolutely elusive, that we can't, we, can't necessarily, we can't necessarily talk about, we can hear, we can feel, we can almost sort of kind of touch, right? But a part of it, I think, is uh, our responsibility to self and community and history and legacy is to pull that forward, is to move it forward as we move forward, right? Is you simply keep doing the work and allowing the work to do the work that the work has to do, right? And part of your responsibility, my sense of my responsibility, is going back again to what I talked about earlier, is participating as deeply and as fully and as complexly as I possibly can within my field, bringing it forward and expanding it and allowing for all the creativity and all the genius that is there, however that is articulated, to be, to be pushed forward to the fullest extent as possible. Yeah. That's the work. That's the work and that's the work for the future. 
and that's the work of our generation. So I'm 66 years old. And a part of me is to make it possible for you to do your work and for Sarah to do her work, and for David to do his work. Exactly. And Skip made it possible for me to do my work. Yeah. And Anna DeVere Smith made it possible for exactly. me to do my work. Exactly. And Deb Willis made it possible for me to do my work, and for Hank to do his work, right? That that is a part of what we do yeah. um, as artists and thinkers and creative beings is to give ourselves of ourselves, to use this bridge called our back so that we can march forward and do the work that we need to do in the strongest possible, clearest possible way. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> All right, so we have two, and, and one is a student of mine, so we have two last questions, and I'd ask that you frame them as questions, and we'll ask for both to, to yeah, be to stated go. together, because we don't want to. And so ask that they both be stated together, and then we'll answer them together. OK. Thank you, and thank you for a wonderful convening. Um, you, a lot of attention, and you were speaking very much about production and the shifting through production. But then there's also the question of reception, right? And I guess I wonder whether your work at all, or whether you consulted all information about I mean, frankly, and, and shifting the conversation slightly from art to science or about the possibility and the wisdom of, of, of some of, of, of science, neuroscience, what we know about actually what kinds of information does cause um, one image to actually resonate and succeed in changing minds in a way another doesn't, or I, I don't know whether any of that information guides your own practice. Um, I, I just be, and if so, who, who informs you that way? Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, hello. I'm, you've both talked a lot about um, inclusion and exclusion in space, and I'm kind of wondering if you can elaborate on like architecture and space in general and how that can offer a form of social justice. I'm interested to reflect on Julian Abel. Yeah. yeah no. I, uh, mm -hmm. I'm. I think starting with the, the last question. Yeah. I think that it's it's a very subliminal thing because it, it really isn't a sort of. It doesn't work in that sort of protest sense, but it's, I think, this idea that if you feel included in making the apparatus of the stage, you're happy to perform. Mm -hmm. That's probably the best way I can say it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Beautiful. yeah. mm -hmm. Beautifully put. And if you don't, I don't think if you, and, and so that idea of knowing that you are part of that construction mm -hmm. is what's critical about inclusion in architecture, in space, in cities that we're in. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's probably yeah. the best thing I could say. On that note, I, I would like to offer this as a way to introduce the extraordinary performance. Um, I'm looking forward to having more, I know she's, <laughs> having more time to speak with David Ajay tomorrow in our morning session in Sanders uh, with the Astor Gates. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> we're just so excited, we're going to clap. <laughs> For the tea. <laughs> more, more time tomorrow. But the uh, next performance came about also because of reflecting on what it means to not feel included in a particular space because of architecture. Are we being asked to leave? No, I don't think so. <laughs> um, the w moment I was standing in the um, Richmond-based, at the time, American Museum for the Confederacy, now renamed museum, was a time in which I received a phone call and it was, I was facing Jefferson Davis's mansion, the White House for the Confederacy, and I received a phone call that I'll never forget, and it was really kind of prompted or created by um, Adam Weinberg, the director of the Whitney. He'd recommended that the director of the Spoleto Festival contact me to think through how best, how best for an artist um, to commemorate the lives lost in the shooting in the Emanuel Baptist Church by Dylan Roof, the Emanuel Nine. What kind of work could possibly be done as a moment of grace for these, for these lives lost? And it's not a call I wanted to receive. At the time, I had just started working here at Harvard, and I believe it was my first week, and I was in the archives to produce scholarship. And I, took the phone call and I said, well, um, and I looked across to my left to the Jefferson Davis mansion and thought, right, this is part of the work. <coughs> and 
on the other end of the line was this request for me to think for some time about what artist I could possibly consider for this project. And I said, I don't need any time at all. The artist that you should choose is Carrie Mae Weems. And this project began this now multi-venued performance, Grace Notes, which became past tense, and is a way to consider and how art can function as, and I will not call it social justice, I never do, representational justice for our field, for our community, and for our world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This convening is deliberately uh, bifurcated Thursday and Friday and is meant to conclude with Carrie's performance in part because I think we'll have uh, time because of the evening uh, to reflect on it. It's extraordinarily powerful, and you can tell she doesn't want me to be genuflecting to her and speaking about how extraordinary she is. But this piece just brought me to my knees mm. when I saw it for the first time. And it, for me, it's an unspeakable privilege to be able to have you perform a modular component of it for us today. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Carrie. We'll be back in a few minutes. 15 minutes ago. 15 minutes ago.